we have we have really enjoyed being here. And this I should be saying this tonight, not this morning. But since some of you don't come on Sunday night, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sunday night really is my favorite service of all in any church. Sunday night, you're not time conscious. Uh, that is not the lid off the church. <laughs> I quit kicking things under the pulpit and help with it. We really enjoy being here. This is this is uh, a church home for us when we're anywhere over in this neck of the woods, and we enjoyed this opportunity to be able to be with you every Sunday night and and wander around a little bit on Sunday mornings and preach a few other places around, but then to come back here and feel at home. I don't know if we've ever stayed, had the bus parked in one place for two months. We, uh, <laughs> we love your pastor in life. They have been good friends. You know, when you do what we do, you end up with thousands of friends, but only a few really special close friends, and, and they are in that category, as, as are John and Delma, and we have highest respect for John and Delma. Yeah. And, we've adopted. and we've adopted Alice. <laughs> we didn't actually ask her. And we've adopted Rusty. Well, we did. Uh, Rusty came with the family. Yes, I know, but. We could get really carried away. Okay. Well, that's not the way we say it. We got. We got to get ready for camp, don't we? We got to say okay. There are things that I say that I am known for that are not necessarily inspirational. <laughs> I preached Sunday morning a few weeks back on Darla Yates and the dialysis machine. And after that, Shelly Metcalf gave me a sheet of paper with some much more in-depth things about dialysis. And she said to me, after you read this, you will probably want for there to be dialysis sermon number two. Behold. <laughs> Dialysis sermon number two. I thought we were going to do communion this morning, and this would have been a fabulous message to go with communion, but they'll all remember every word I speak. And if not, they can get a copy or watch this again on YouTube. How am I doing for commercials? Great <laughs> it. Exodus 12 and verse 13 how many believe that? How many believe in miracles? How many believe that I will be done by noon? We don't believe in that much, miracles that much. Not one hand, Pastor. Not even yours went up. <laughs> Are we having a potluck dinner? Yes. You might make that. In the newly remodeled fellowship hall. Really? Have you ever heard me eat? Yeah. <laughs> Exodus 12, 13. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. This is, this is the this is the story of the plagues coming upon Egypt. 
the cry of Moses, let my people go. And this is about the last plague that was about to happen. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, you remember what they were supposed to do? They were supposed to kill a lamb, their friend, their friend. The lamb has lived in their house for four days. It's a family pet by this time. And they are going to kill their friend, and their friend's blood is going to be painted on the top and on each side of the doorposts. I can preach sermon number three, too. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Hence, for from this point on, it was called the Passover. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And why not them? Because of the blood on the doorpost, on the top and both sides, when I see the blood, I will pass over. Father, thank you for such a marvelous plan. <laughs> really, you're, you are so awesome that you are the only one who could have ever come up with a plan like this. I thank you that you did and that it has worked for all these generations. Would you bless us this morning in Jesus' name? Amen. Dan Mannix, in a book that he wrote called The Last Eagle, tells the story of an eagle that lived near ranch country. And this eagle had acquired a fondness for groundhog. He had a special craving for one special groundhog, the great granddaddy of them all, who lived in a huge hole surrounded by alfalfa. One afternoon, the big chuck was sitting in the warm sun, gazing lazily off into the distance, and without warning, the eagle came in from behind him. Just before the eagle grabbed him, the shadow got there first. And the groundhog dove into his hole. But as he dove, the eagle's talons sunk into the hindquarters of the groundhog. Groundhog plunged underground. Once inside his tunnel, the big chuck braced his feet against the sides of the tunnel. And then with his claws digging in, inch by inch, he began to worm his way down. The eagle tried to let go, but he couldn't. An eagle has very poor coordination between his eyes and his talons. And once he's locked his talons onto something, it's really hard for him to let go. So with his muscles tensed as he's being pulled into the hole, with his muscles tensed, he can't make himself let go. The old groundhog began to drag him down. First the eagle's legs disappeared into the hole. <coughs> then his lower body. And then clear up to the base of his wings. Clamp to the dying groundhog. He was stuck there. 
hopelessly. By morning, the groundhog was long dead. But the eagle could not let go. And so even though the groundhog is dead, he still got hold of it. In the early morning sun, he barely had enough strength left to open his eyes and glare toward the pulsing sound of a John Deere tractor. The farmer saw him, climbed off the tractor. There was little struggle to resist the farmer, a few quick scoops with a shovel and the big bird was free. Once free of the burrow, relief allowed his muscles to relax, and he lost his hold on the dead groundhog. But he lay there after struggling half the day and all the night. He now lay there free but exhausted. So the man went back to the tractor and brought a canteen of water. And he took the canteen of water, poured it out on the exhausted eagle, who sputtered and recovered somewhat, slowly struggled to his feet, and then extended his big wings, almost at arms, his wings <laughs> and groggily took off, became airborne, headed toward his nest, but he was free. Few illustrations better reflect the rescuing work of the Lord Jesus Christ than this story. Within ourselves, we like to think of ourselves as able to handle anything and everything that comes our way. But experience shows us that that is not true. There's an old hymn in the hymn books. Some of them may be under your seat on that little shelf. It asks this question says, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, is the flow <clears throat> that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know but the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> There's a marvelous medical procedure that helps explain the work of the blood of Jesus. And you can thank Shelley Metcalf for having enlarged upon what I said last time. It's a marvelous cleansing procedure that cleanses contamination from the sick and often dying person cleansing the contamination out of the bloodstream. It's called dialysis. It involves the use of an artificial kidney. And I explained all of that last time, but three of you were not here. The contaminated blood enters one end of the plastic artificial kidney. And that plastic kidney is filled with fibers. 
The blood runs into the kidney through all those fibers. Coming from the other end, there is a cleansing solution. That cleansing solution, Shelley told me, is called dialysate. It's very important. Not any cleansing solution will work. You, you don't want to use Formula 409 or Pine Saw or Spick and Spam. Or, was that Spam or Spam? Spam. I like Spam. <laughs> not, not, not Clorox, not Mr. Clean, not Comet Cleanser. None of them can do what dialysate can do. It's not that you run any cleanser through that machine. It's a special cleanser that flows through that. And that fluid flowing through pulls out the contamination from the blood. There's tiny little holes in the fibers, Shelley told me. It will allow the contaminants to come out and yet it, will, it keeps the red blood cells and the nutrients and all the good stuff your body needs and keeps them in the bloodstream and kicks the rest of it out into the dialysate that carries it away. <sighs> carries it away. I suppose in that moment as the person is hooked up to the machine, he's really totally at mercy of that cleansing fluid. See, the blood of the patient has already done everything it can do and it failed. But the dialysate, the cleansing fluid flowing by the blood draws the contaminants out by osmosis. I would have looked that up for you, but I can't spell it. When the contaminants are all pulled out of the blood, the blood is clean as it goes on back into the body and the person lives. I want you to pay particular attention to the cleansing fluid called dialysate. Without the cleansing fluid, without the dialysate, the whole process loses its ability. <laughs> While the contaminated blood and the cleansing fluid do not ever actually come in contact with each other, still the contamination is pulled away. My friend, the blood of Jesus Christ performs that glorious function in our spirits. Hallelujah. I can spell that. <laughs> My soul has already done all that it could do for itself. And it failed. My heart desperately needs a marvelous cleansing procedure that cleanses contaminations out of my hurting soul. Doesn't cover them up. Doesn't masquerade them as something else. Takes on glory. Without the cleansing fluid, without the blood of Jesus, 
the whole life-changing procedure would not be effective in my soul. It's not any kind of cleanser that works. It's the blood of Jesus that works and His blood alone. I want you to see a picture way back in the Old Testament. Uh oh, I went past 12, didn't I? You were hoping that for every minute I went past 12 that I will that I will not eat one spoonful of food. You're wrong. <laughs> I want you to see a picture way back in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement in the temple. On that day, the Day of Atonement, the high priest took the blood from the sacrificed lamb and he takes it in a bowl and enters the Holy of Holies. As he goes into the Holy of Holies, he's the only human who is allowed to go in there. And then only once a year. Inside the Holy of Holies, do we have any Indiana, Indiana Jones fans here? Three Indiana Jones fans. The Ark of the Covenant on Indiana Jones really wasn't that far off as far as the, as the Ark itself. Pretty much. It was in the Holy of Holies. The high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement carries this basin of blood from the sacrificed lamb and he carries it into the Holy of Holies and he sprinkles the blood from the sacrifice onto the mercy seat. That's the, that's the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. In the Ark of the Covenant is the law, the actual tablets, the mercy seat is what comes between the law and God. And he sprinkles the blood from the sacrifice on the mercy seat. If God didn't accept that he would have died there. But when he returns back outside, it says to the couple of thousand million, couple of, <laughs> a couple of million, let's get the thousand out. I don't know about thousand million, but I can't count that high. The fact that he comes back out says to the Israelis, God has accepted the sacrifice. Our sins are forgiven. And they had a hallelujah breakdown. When the time of fulfilling the Old Testament types came, the Lord Jesus was the fulfillment for those things that God provided. And Jesus went to the cross Of his own will, they could have never put him there. I said, they could have never put him there if he hadn't have been willing to go. All he had to do was speak one word and they would have just... He let himself be nailed to the cross. Gave up his life. And then in the spirit world carried his own blood into heaven. And into heaven's holy of holies. And he carried his own blood unto the Father and sprinkled out his own blood on heaven's mercy seat. To take care of my sin and yours. God. Not just once but over and over and on and on. Hallelujah. There's a, there's a great passage of Scripture in Hebrews 9 
that you, you won't comprehend all of it in one reading. You'll have to read it a whole bunch of times to even start to comprehend it. But let me try to help you in Hebrews 9 and verse 24. Listen closely. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands. Okay, he's not, we're not talking about the one in the tabernacle. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then, that is then, if he had to do it every year like the high priest had to, for then he would have had to suffer since the foundation of the world. But now once, somebody say once. In the end of the world has he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hallelujah. John states in Revelation that he saw Christ in heaven as a lamb newly slain. I want you to know that in heaven this never gets old. I hope that this never gets old for you. There is no decaying with God. His sacrifices never diminish. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Yeah. School teachers, Calvary is always present tense. It's good for right now. Hallelujah. The blood has never lost its power. It's the anointing blood of the Lord Jesus, the mediator, Hebrews calls him. It was good then. And it still is. I want you to know that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He said it's time for old things. That's, that's not talking about John and I. It's the time for old things. He's talking about the stuff inside us. That it is time for old things to pass away. And all things to become new. Hallelujah. When Paul used the Greek word that's translated passed away, it's a word that could have been translated receded. I bring that up to you because a receipt is something that is offered after a transaction has been completed. Amen. You don't get a receipt for something you hope to do. You get a receipt for something that's done. And when Paul used the word passed away, he's talking about it being receded. Hallelujah. Jesus did it. It's taken care of. It's not in the future. It's a very present past. Hallelujah. Sometimes a person's own systems can no longer meet the demands of infections that, that, that gurgle in. Is that a good word? I can't spell that either. <laughs> Gurgle inside our systems. <coughs> In such moments, we hurting people need to return to the love of Jesus. Where he can begin to filter. You listening to me? You got to listen because we'll get to lunch quicker if you listen. <laughs> We need to get back to the love of Jesus where he can filter the contaminants out of our beings. 
by his blood. The book of Hebrews says to you that your high priest has offered the total sacrifice for sins. He entered into the Holy of Holies. Hallelujah. The blood has been sprinkled on the mercy seat and God the Father accepted it. May I challenge you this morning before we hurry off to lunch to get plugged into heaven's dialysis machine. A fresh flow of his cleansing blood will pull the contaminations out of your system. And you need it. I'm not embarrassed to admit to you in this service that I desire his purging flow to flow through me again, Pastor. God set us free from the contamination of this world, set us free from the distractions to absorb our spiritual strength. Like the eagle and that old groundhog. Was that so long ago you can't remember the story? Yeah. Even when the thing that trapped us has finally died to us, it still is difficult for us to release our hold on that thing. Your struggles can overwhelm you until at the point of spiritual exhaustion we finally just give up. In some moments in our lives everything looks hopeless. But wait. Can you hear it? Suppose there are John Deere tractors in heaven. Can you hear the Johnny Popper? Moving toward you in this moment. He comes, he does, to set us free. He reaches down to pull you out of the hole that you got yourself into. There's a canteen of living water hanging on the tractor, Pastor. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden, as you relax in Jesus, your grip loosens of that awful stuff of the world. This is good preaching, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> Suddenly, you are bathed in his love bathed in his understanding, bathed in his refreshment. If you're floundering in heavy seas this morning, if wave after wave of sin or defeat try to sweep over you, listen, you have a chance this morning for a fresh grip on victory. There's another old song. Don't you like it when I pull out the old songs? Even Rusty likes it when I pull out the old songs. It's been sung at thousands and thousands of altar calls. It said, softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. There's a whole bunch of great verses, the chorus says, come home. Come home.
stuff that you have fought so desperately against in your life and can never get the victory, well, that's because he's the only 